And in this session, we will have a keynote uh, from Judge Robert Spano, the president of the European Court of Human Rights. And we're very privileged and honored to have him with us today. Judge Robert Spano was elected to the European Court of Human Rights in 2013 with respect to Iceland. And by the way, in case any of you were in doubt, Iceland joined the Council of Europe in 1950. So it's one of the oldest and most loyal members of the Council of Europe. Um, he is currently president of the court. Before picking up his judicial office, he served as parliamentary ombudsman of Iceland from 2009 to 2010, and again in 2013. He served as Dean of the Faculty of Law at the University of Iceland, where he had, was first appointed professor in 2006. He was chairman of the Standing Committee of Experts in Criminal Law in the Icelandic Ministry of Justice. And uh, he was also the Icelandic delegate to the European Committee on Crime Problems, as well as an independent expert to the Lanzarote Committee of the Council of Europe. Judge Spano is a graduate both of the University of Iceland and of the University of Oxford. And I might add that I believe he was also an ad hoc judge on the EFTA court, so therefore had very close encounters with EU law as well. President Spano will talk about the role of European and national courts in upholding the rule of law. Before turning the floor over to him, let me just say that we want to organize this keynote in an interactive manner. So if you have questions, you can send them to us via the questions box at the bottom of your screen, and we will feed them into the discussion after Judge Spano has finished his talk. So now it's my great pleasure to turn the floor over to President Spano. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. Uh, it is a great pleasure for me to be a part of today's proceedings to talk about a very, very important topic uh, for the development of the fundamental principles of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. I want to begin by thanking most warmly Professor Dr. Jan Walters, coordinator of the ReConnect Research Project for inviting me to address you here today. I see, as I mentioned, that the fundamental aim of this project resonates well with the three core principles that I just mentioned. While your pro project focuses on strengthening the legitimacy of the European Union in many citizens' minds, Europe is an amorphous space which combines different aspects of the work of the European Union and the Council of Europe alike. For example, in the pre-Brexit referendum debates in the United Kingdom, public attention was equally focused on the Strasbourg Court as well as the Luxembourg Court. Therefore, I see your research work as equally important within the larger legal space of the Council of Europe's 47 European states. So let me begin by the global challenges we are currently facing. Now, that is, of course, a very wide ranging issue, but allow me to pinpoint the following five challenges. Firstly, the technical re revolution we are living through. Here I could mention developments in artificial intelligence, social media, and the rise of online hate, misinformation, and fake news. These developments have already, already have and will continue to have repercussions on democracy and the rule of law. Secondly, we have witnessed great societal change over the last few decades, such as the strengthening of LGBTI rights and the unfortunate current backlash against those rights. Thirdly, I would like to cite the environment and the challenges posed by climate change. For the courts, a particular question arises. What, if any, should they role should they play at the domestic and the European level in responding to climate change litigation? Fourthly, our post-pandemic society. How do we rebuild ourselves following economic disruption? How do we ensure that emergency powers and restrictions put in place during the last 18 months do not remain our new normal? How do we respond to the inequalities upon which COVID-19 has shown a light? Fifthly, but no less importantly, political polarization, challenges to the rule of law and judicial independence and what we have called rule of law backsliding. Multilateral institutions, such as the European Union and the Council of Europe, 
are also liable to challenges and weakening. Faced with these challenges, how do we strengthen the rule of law and renew trust in democracy? One of the answers your project focuses upon is to reset citizen participation in the European project. One may ask in this context, what if any role do courts have in reinforcing citizen belief in and attachment to the fundamental European values of democracy and the rule of law? I will revert to this question in a moment, but first, a brief discussion of the legal and conceptual bases of these values. In the landmark judgment in Golder versus the United Kingdom of 1975, the Strasbourg Court made clear that the rule of law is one of the features of the common spiritual heritage of the member states of the Council of Europe. As I've set out extrajudicially in a recent article on the rule of law, the foundational moral idea behind the rule of law, which lies at the core of all convention protections, is the respect for personal autonomy and the exclusion of the arbitrary use of governmental power. The rule of law, by requiring that governmental power be regulated by law and not the whims and caprice of men, demands that laws are clear and not excessively vague and open to abuse, so as to negate the autonomous choices made by members of society based on existing rules. The law must be relatively stable and secure legal certainty. The rule of law does not allow for unfettered powers to be granted to the organs of government. Laws must be interpreted and applied by independent and impartial courts. And that once courts have rendered final and binding judgments, they should not be called into question. These conceptual elements of the rule of law exp explain why this fundamental principle is anathema to authoritarian states or the realms of dictators and why rule of law and democracy go hand in hand. I will now turn to the role of national courts and the European Court of Human Rights in upholding the rule of law. I will make three points. First, the fundamental values of the European Union and the Council of Europe are increasingly being called into question, both at the European and the global level. Institutions which promote multilateralism are also vulnerable to attack, as are domestic and international judges. This is what the Secretary General of the Council of Europe calls democratic backsliding and is evidenced by litigation before the Court of Justice of the European Union and the Strasbourg Court on topics such as judicial independence. As we all know, an efficient, impartial, and independent judiciary is the cornerstone of a functioning system of democratic checks and balances. Judges are the means by which powerful interests are restrained. They guarantee that all individuals, irrespective of their backgrounds, are treated equally before the law. Courts preserve the core value underpinning the fundamental idea of a constitutional democracy, which is this. Democracy values everyone equally, even if the majority does not. Let's not forget that history has repeatedly taught us that unchecked majority rule risks descending into authoritarianism. The judiciary is therefore an essential component of democratic societies and a key institution that needs to be protected. As I've said on a number of occasions, the principle of the rule of law is an empty vessel without independent courts embedded within a democratic structure which protects and preserves fundamental rights. Without independent judges, the convention system cannot function. It is clear that this existential argument applies as well directly within the European Union, as the Court of Justice has made clear in a number of landmark judgments on judicial independence in recent years, 
starting with the Portuguese judge's case of 2016. I will come back to the relationship between Strasbourg and Luxembourg in a moment. To conclude this first point, the common thread here is that an efficient, impartial, and independent judiciary is the cornerstone of a functioning system of democratic checks and balances. They guarantee, as I mentioned, that all individuals, in particular those vulnerable, those part of our minorities, irrespective of their backgrounds, are treated equally before the law. My second point underlines the quality and importance of judicial dialogue between the Strasbourg and Luxembourg courts on rule of law issues. As I just mentioned, the Court of Justice of the European Union has in recent years rendered important rulings in the field of judicial independence under the Treaty on European Union and the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. The jurisprudential core of many of these rulings relies upon Strasbourg case law and Strasbourg case law itself relies upon the findings of the Luxembourg court. The recent case of Grünmünter Andre Austrasson versus Iceland in, is a case in point, and in particular, the Grand Chamber's reliance on the principle of irremovability of judges, as set out in Commission versus Poland. The important element to highlight here is the clear symmetry of values between the two systems. This is the case despite the procedural differences between cases brought to each European court. Rule of law issues are raised before the Luxembourg court by way of references for preliminary rulings and infringement proceedings. Before the Strasbourg court, the individual applicants are the directly affected parties to domestic proceedings. Yet the two systems are evidently complementary and mutually reinforcing. There are ongoing negotiations on the EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights, which in my view can only be positive in bringing the two systems more closely together. It is important to highlight that accession by the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights is a fundamental rule of law issue itself. Accession to the Convention will guarantee more forcefully that no element of legal uncertainty in the protection of human rights in the European legal space can be relied upon by those that want to undermine, those that want to deprive the European citizenry of the full benefits of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. My third point focuses on the implementation of judgments of the court and how this contributes in a very concrete way to upholding the rule of law. In a state governed by the rule of law, final and binding judgments of courts must be executed without exception. The same applies to judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, which, by which a state is bound under international law. Implementing judgments by courts that are established in accordance with the law, in particular in relation to rule of law issues, may involve complex reforms at the domestic level through notably important constitutional reform. Judgments of the European Court of Human Rights point out deficiencies at the national level. However, remedying these deficiencies takes political will as well as financial and other resources. Professor, ladies and gentlemen, this brings me to my conclusion where I come back to the question I posed at the outset. What, if any, role do courts have in reinforcing citizen belief in and attachment to the fundamental European values of democracy and the rule of law? My answer is this. Reinforcing citizen belief in the fundamental European values of the rule of law, democracy, and human rights requires courts to be effective communicators, to articulate their pronouncements clearly, with cogent and coherent legal reasoning, but also to be visible and transparent in their day-to-day -day operations. We must all together make our citizens realize what Europe, indeed the world, would look like without the rule of law.
Do we want a world in which the rule of unfettered political power would constitute the main rule, the very means by which our lives would be regulated? This would be a world in which our fundamental rights to liberty, freedom of expression, to lead a private life, to enjoy family life, would all be subject to the unfettered and arbitrary will of majoritarian sentiment without recourse to independent and impartial courts. Yes, let, yet let's be frank. We cannot solely rely on the courts to solve the rule of law challenges we are witnessing. The judiciary cannot strengthen the rule of law alone. A true human rights culture cannot be sustained in the long run by the top-down imposition of legal norms that do not resonate in contemporary societies. Human rights must exist in the hearts and minds of peoples and their representatives in communal life. This echoes the theme of today's conference earning citizens respect. A pervasive rule of law and human rights culture must exist not just within the judiciary, but also in parliaments and within civil society, as well as with, with citizens. It must reside in the hearts and minds of those politicians that want to be taken and dealt with and, and be, govern, be those that govern us in our societies. To conclude, some have argued that the void growing within European societies started from and in many ways was a result of the end of the Second World War. On this view, man searches for significance and meaning in his life. This cannot be filled alone through material gain and prosperity. This metaphysical need was previously filled through aspects of day-to-day -day life, which have to an extent been eschewed in modern liberal democracies within the last half century. For example, an emphasis on duties and responsibilities to others rather than the individual as an island onto himself. According to this argument, this void and the need for meaning beyond the individual experience has been filled with populism. If this is correct, in resetting citizens' trust in our European project, we must recall the importance of collective values, of a shared experience, of the individual in community, albeit forever protected from abusive and arbitrary exercises of governmental power by a robust and reinforced understanding of the importance of democracy, the rule of law, and human rights. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you so much. And I wish you could hear the applause from everybody who's out there in our audience. It's incredibly heartening and really a, a wonderful occasion to hear such a strong defense of the mission of your court and of the, the vision of values for Europe. Um, I er encourage all of the members of our audience to <clears throat> start putting questions in the question and answer box. Um, and while I'm uh, collecting those, let me just uh, start with one question, if I, if I may. Um, one of the things we're seeing in some of the countries that are engaged in the most dramatic examples of democratic backsliding is that judges who are sending cases to the European Court of Justice on reference procedures are, are getting punished through domestic disciplinary proceedings. Now, your court has a slightly different problem because, of course, applicants have to exhaust domestic remedies in their in their home countries before they can come to your court. So one of the things I think we may be seeing in some countries is that the judicial process for the cases that may go to Strasbourg gets massively slowed down. <laughs> and particularly when you get to sort of the last stage before a case would get to Strasbourg, there are often no deadlines at all. And so applicants are kind of caught in this limbo where they haven't yet uh, they're not going to get any remedy in their home courts for all the reasons that you mentioned with regard to judicial independence, but they also can't get finality in the judgments in their home countries to get to Strasbourg. So that's sort of the equivalent of punishing the judges who are sending references to the Court of Human Rights. If, if courts are captured in a member state, they can prevent cases from reaching the stage where petitioners can go to Strasbourg. So I'm wondering, 
what should applicants do in those cases? You know, where they, where they, where the demet, where the lack of independence of the judiciary is preventing them from meeting the criteria for going to Strasbourg. Well, as you mentioned, um, the European Convention on Human Rights as a system based on the principle of subsidiarity, which is of course, in a sense, a different principle under convention law than it is under union law, is based on the premise that it is for the national authorities to protect and preserve human rights. So that means that we, the cases need to be dealt with fi finally, with a final decision at national level. But Article 35 of the convention is clear that the exhaustion of remedies at national level is limited to those remedies which are effective. Now, there is a long-standing case law of the court which deals with the concept of effectiveness for the purposes of Article 35, which, which is informed by the general human right to a, an effective remedy under Article 13. So I, I, of course, am not in a position to comment on any particular factual scenario, but it is certainly not the case that necessarily the, the recourse to a national court, which clearly does not meet the requirements of effectiveness, is necessary before applicants can meet the exhaustion requirement in Strasbourg. A claim can be made that the remedy that allegedly needs to be exhausted according to the government is one which is not effective for the purposes of the convention. So that is something we have to assess on a, in a given case, whether that allegation of the lack of effectiveness of a remedy is such as to render the application admissible, even though finality has not been determined at national level. I think that's very important for people to hear. And so thank you so much for that answer. We now have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, let me take one here. Um, rule of law back backsliding is, in, is occurring in some EU member states, as you noted. Do you see that these developments are also interfering with the European Court of Human Rights and how it operates? So do you directly have to deal with this in your day-to-day -day work? I mean, the European Court of Human Rights is an international human rights court. Uh, it, 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 it simply flows from the nature of our jurisdiction that we will have to deal with the most contentious issues at any given point that are percolating within the European legal space. So no, the, it is not as such a problem for the court because this is what the court is doing and should do. We are there to provide uh, for uh, or deal with cases in which allegations of backlash against human rights protections in a given member states are raised. Of course, uh, we are and we have to realize, and I mentioned this in my intervention, the history of the European Court of Human Rights is one where it has seen uh, an ebb and flow into the level in which multilateral international institutions have been accepted or considered to be legitimate within sort of the geopolitical sphere in which they operate. Uh, to the extent that international institutions are now facing uh, a potential backlash of legitimacy, uh, which is of course for academics and commentators to reflect upon, it is clear that in that sense, the European Court of Human Rights as one of those institutions and perhaps one of the preeminent institutions in the world having to deal with these issues at the European level will in some shape or form will be affected by th this development. But my firm conviction is, and I make this very clear, the European Court of Human Rights is a court. We are not an NGO, we're not a policy organ. We decide cases on the merits. We decide cases based on legal arguments. And the, 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 the fact that we are in, in, a, in, an air, in an environment which is, can be very critical, an environment which may sometimes create very uh, tense emotions uh, should not and does not have an impact on our work. Yeah, that actually leads to another question that's here in the question box. Um, and uh, where one of the members of our audience asks you, what is your view on the allegation 
that several judges of your court have allegedly too tight relationships to human rights NGOs such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, in which, which I guess was argued in a 2020 report of the European Center for Justice and Law. In other words, are certain uh, NGOs uh, too close to your court? or too close to some judges on your court? I mean, I, I, Professor, I've answered this question many, many times over the past year, and also my predecessor, Judge Sicilianos. Uh, I do not accept, I disagree with the findings made in this report, which I think is not merited. Let's just be clear. Every judge of the European Court of Human Rights is elected by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe based on their curriculum vitae, which uh, is clear, it is there, transparent for everyone to see before they are elected. It goes without saying that the European Court of Human Rights has and always will be to some extent uh, manned by those experts, human rights lawyers, which to a certain extent may have had uh, working relations or been uh, de dealing with issues within the realms of non-governmental organizations and those that work in the realm of human rights. It would be very strange if it were not the case. But what happens when you become a judge is that you leave your past behind. That happens to all of us. One, one may turn this around and ask, well, what about those judges of the court that have led all of their professional lives in government? Are they clo too close to the government of the member state? I think this is not a fair, not a justified way of viewing the issue. And I say once again, there is no reason to call into question the objectivity and impartiality of the judges of the court at this general level. Finally, the rules of the court are clear. As for any judges, judges have to be open to a uh, request for their withdrawal or recusal from a case. Now, if in a particular case, a party to a case considers that a judge, due to past professional practices or for whatever reason, should recuse from a case, there are formal procedures for that within the court, and those are always taken seriously and dealt with on the merits. Terrific, well, thank you. That, that's, I think it's always good to get that out on the table. Um, we have another question. Um, by the way, the questions are all saying, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I think you've really kind of strengthened everyone's spine on this question. Um, so one questioner says that you made a forceful case for the core conception of the rule of law but how can we convince citizens of its importance? Do you have any advice on how to communicate the importance of the rule of law to a kind of more general public? I think their uh, communication and really sustained communication at the grassroots level is very important. The problem with the rule of law is that it is quite opaque and vague for the general layman or a person. It, it, it sounds good, but often it is used as a slogan, even in political debates. I have made clear the rule of law is a normative principle of law. It is not open to negotiation. It is not open to political compromise. It is not merchandise, which can be dealt with in political campaigns as those that seek power see fit. But we have to explain this that this is a fundamental principle for the prosperity, stability, and the peaceful re relations of peoples. Now, how do we do that? I think we need to start in primary schools. I think we need to start in at, at very early to explain to people what this actually means. This is a, a, a concept which creates elements of reasonableness, creates elements of balance, creates elements of proportionality, it opens up transparent decision-making. It creates the possibility for checks on the, in the use of public powers. And, we, and all of us, all of us, us that are in this field need to come together and create a systemic platform of dissemination on the underlying concepts that we are talking about. I very much like the persuasive force as I tried in my intervention to utilize, which is the persuasive force of arguing, what would the world look like without the rule of law? And I think we have examples from history which are very clear. And when one proceeds on the basis and explaining to uh, peoples what the world would look like if the law was not a constraining factor, 
if we would not have the separation of powers, if we would not have a meaningful check on whether our fundamental rights are being protected, I think that would open the eyes of many people because today we are to, to too much extent dealing with this issue at the, the technical level, at a level of abstraction, which does not resonate at ground level. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, several questions here about the relationship between your court and the ECJ or between European human rights law and European law. You know, many of us were quite um, disappointed, shall we say, at, at the least by the 213 judgment of the, of the Court of Justice. And yet it seems like your two courts are really, you know, one foot and then the other sort of developing, going down the same path, particularly on rule of law. Um, and so one of our, our member, audience members asks, what's the added value of accession of the EU to the European Convention? Since the ECJ already ensures control with fundamental rights on the basis of an almost identical body of rule. So you mentioned a kind of gap in your talk and I'm wondering if you could elaborate what you think accession would add that we don't have already in the system. I mean, uh, over and above the simple fact that the European Union has a treaty-based obligation to accede to the convention. And as a matter of symbolism, and as a matter of coherence, for a, for a union like the European Union, for a, a, an organization like the European Union, which is a forceful and should be a forceful rule of law environment, to be in a position where that obligation has not been respected is of course as such problematic symbolically. But for me as a judge and a lawyer, there are more technical benefits that I would like to mention. Currently, we have a system in which European Union law is being internally enforced by the European Ju Court of Justice as the Supreme Court of the European Union, mainly through what I would call abstract review. Preliminary references are a means by which the EU court, the Court of Justice, harmonizes the content of EU law for the purposes of the domestic application of EU law by the referring court. The same when it comes to infringement proceedings. There you're dealing with uh, a question of uh, posed by the commission as to the general level of conformity by a member state. What is needed, in my view, is the finality there the ex post facto international control, which would come with the accession of the, the, the EU to the European Court of Human Rights, where the European Court is engaged in direct review, direct individual rights application review, where it is the international court, the Strasbourg Court, which finally determines at the level only limited, of course, to human rights questions, which, as we know, already are symbiotically merged by Article 52.3 of the EU Charter with the charter-based obligation to take account of convention law in the determination of the content of the charter. It would allow for the full holistic human rights protection regime, which EU accession is premised on. And I do think that would be a very, very important addition uh, for the overall integrity of the EU system of protection of fundamental rights. Very helpful. And uh, one question related to this that I've heard mentioned uh, on many occasions is that one of the differences between, of course, the EU system and the ECHR system is that there are different member states of the two systems. And in particular, with regard to rule of law, the worst rule of law offenders in the European Union are not necessarily the worst rule of law offenders in the Council of Europe, because there are many more states that have even bigger problems than the states that are parts of the EU. So to what extent do you think the, the different membership of the two um, uh, institutions, the EU and the Council of Europe, to what extent does that change the jurisprudence of the two courts? For example, your court gets a lot of human rights 
cases that would be a little bit unthinkable inside the EU. Um, and similarly, as you're sort of calibrating, you know, what the convention means, the scope of the convention, the range of countries, the range of cultures that your decisions um, fit into is so much bigger. <laughs> Do you think that that affects the ability of the two institutions, the Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice, to arrive at similar standards? I, I wouldn't, of course, uh, want to exclude that historically these two different paradigms that you mentioned have potentially had an impact on the development of lines or strands of case law of the two courts. Let's not forget that the normative structure of decision making between the two courts is, of course, radically different. The European Court of Human Rights is, has only jurisdiction to interpret the convention. The convention is a human rights treaty with quite open-ended and vague principles which need to be filled and interpreted uh, as the court has been doing for the last 60 years. The European Court of Justice it, is in a different normative environment where it is part, uh, it's, its role is often and primarily to interpret secondary EU law directives and regulations, which really give sustenance to many of the human rights issues and the starting point is a bit different. From our perspective, I would, however, say and emphasize this, that the European Court of Human Rights never decides a human rights question in a complete vacuum from the European Union framework as laid out in the 27, which are part of the 47. So methodologically, you will see that even when we decide cases for a non-EU member states, for example, in the field of migration, you will see us look, looking at, you will see us viewing the construct and the constellation of arguments for the purposes of the convention by taking account of the developments within EU law. Now, why are we doing this? That is why that it is because the minimum standards for the 47 must always be determined at a level which is su sufficient and allows for accommodating the developments of the two systems. And finally, I would highlight what I just mentioned, minimum standards. The convention is a system of minimum standards. It does not preclude, and this is is the last sentence of Article, Article 52.3 of the Charter. Protections of human rights within the EU can as such be higher or more extensive than with under the convention. And this applies also to the 20 non-EU member states. So we are dealing with a benchmark, a minimum common denominator across the 47. And again, we always try to keep abreast of the overall development so as to harmonize the two systems as much as possible. When it comes to the European Court of Justice, I have made the case and I have had recently uh, discussions and debates publicly with uh, uh, my counterpart, Kun Lennertz, that it is of course very much important for the court, the two courts to, to continue with their axiological convergence, especially in the field of judicial independence. We must proceed there down a road because as a matter of law, as a matter of conceptual interpretation, there aren't strong reasons for divergence in the two systems when it comes to that fundamental structural pillar, which is the same under Article 19 TEEU and Article 47 on the Charter on the one hand, and Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, thank you. We have a we have a question uh, from one of our Polish colleagues, uh, who asks, you know, the court the court um, has recently decided that applications concerning the judicial system coming from Poland should be given Category One priority because of their urgency. Can you elaborate why your court has done that and what that concretely means for the cases that are coming from Poland? We have recently, uh, as we have publicly uh, uh, disseminated. The court is now engaged as a corollary of the interlocking process in internal reforms as regards the case processing strategy of the court, where we have made uh, changes to the way we 
articulate and calibrate our priority, priority policy where uh, a certain number of cases which we define as impact cases because of systemic relevance, because of the nature of the convention issue involved, because of their structural significance have been dealt with more expeditiously than others. It is within that context that I would answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So um, and relate on this theme, uh, there's a set of questions. Um, one is, does the politicization of the judgments of your court, for example, by Poland, place new requirements or new pressures for openness and transparency on your court? And do you find that it, does the court find itself in need of justifying its role? And if so, is this unprecedented? In other words, as you get pushback from member states claiming your decisions are purely political, what do you do then? <laughs> I don't want to, I, I do not intend and I will not comment on any perceived uh, messages or politicization made by national authorities. That is not for me to, to engage in that kind of conversation. The only thing I would say, again, the European Court of Human Rights has forever been now and then met with criticism, met with potential backlash because of judgments rendered by the court. That is simply part and parcel of what we do. We are, after all, uh, finding in some cases that national authorities, political powers have violated the convention. Uh, the fact that the court is met with some reactions of that sort does not as such re require a reaction of the court. The court continues its work undaunted, based on objective principle, providing legal arguments for its reasoning. It is then for others to either come to the court's aid publicly to demonstrate the integrity of the system, and of course, for us to continue to do our work as objectively and impartially as possible. Courts should not be constantly engaging with or reacting to the tempests of the day. That is not what courts do. It is for others to take part in that battle. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we have several um, questions here about the enforcement of your decisions. And one question has to do with the interaction between your court and the committee of ministers. And I'm wondering, um, I'm going to elaborate on the question that came in from the audience. What does that interaction look like? And when the committee of ministers decides what is actually um, a, uh, uh, an enforcement or what, you know, what are the criteria for meeting um, the requirements of your decisions, how much does the court interact with the committee of ministers and shape what compliance with a decision will look like that the committee of ministers then enforces? Uh, there is no formal interaction, uh, and it shouldn't be. The court, uh, under Article 46 of the Convention, uh, does not take part in the execution process. That is a matter for the Committee of Ministers. That is the system we have in place. This is a system based on the political supervision of the execution process. The court's contribution to that process is purely at the jurisprudential levels by the court in often in our judgments themselves, providing for either general or individual measures presented under a chapter in our judgments under Article 46, so as to assist in the execution process. But when a judgment has been rendered, it is off the court's table and it is transmitted to the committee of ministers for their decision-making. Having said that, as a matter of pure, uh, what we can say bureaucratic or technical assistance. The registry of the court, of course, has interaction and in disseminating information between the registry and the execution department. But at the level of the court itself, the judges of the court, the level of the president of the court, no formal interaction or formal, uh, formal actions are taken by the court itself in the execution process. Um, and again, all of this, I think, is very important for people to hear because the process looks a little mysterious from the outside. Um, there's a related question here about the relationship between your court and sort of enforcement through EU level. So one of the things that has been proposed um, actually by members of our Reconnect group is that the European Commission 
should take into account non-enforcement of judgments of your court in addition to non-enforcement of judgments from the ECJ in assessing whether an EU member state has met the criteria of the rule of law. And I wonder, um, well, A, if you would welcome that development, but B, if your interactions with your um, with the Court of Justice or with EU institutions um, has put this a little higher on the agenda now that we have these backsliding states in the EU that are not listening to either the Court of Justice or to your court? I think that is, that is a question, it's more of a policy question than a question that I would be comfortable in answering. Uh, I think the only thing I would say, the issues that we are discussing are issues which flow from judgments being rendered by the European Court of Human Rights and the European Court of Justice. And of course, as always, when the judgments are rendered, there, there are other branches of government, civil society and others that react. And it is really for them to take a position on how we react to developments as they flow from, case, from the case law of these two courts. So we have a, another question from a member of our Reconnect group um, on what your advice would be to national court judges um, with regard to European arrest warrant cases or other surrender cases um, or other mutual recognition cases so that they don't violate EU law, which right now requires not just assessing whether uh, a country's legal system is in some trouble, but requires assessing whether the individual court to whom someone may be surrendered is independent. So there's this two part test still in the EU. Your court has said, you know, no surrender back to some place where rights are violated. Generally, those two tests don't always quite line up. So what should national courts do if they feel a little bit caught in the crossfire between the judgments of your court and the judgments of the ECJ? Well, Professor, here there are several questions which are uh, I should be careful to answer because they are to some extent still outstanding in our case law. But as a general matter, I would simply recount the current state of the case law. As you mentioned yourself, the European Court of Justice has adopted a two-step test assess assessing systemic deficiencies on the one hand, and on the other, an individual risk assessment at the second level if the first step is made. The court has both done that in the classical Article 4 charter type cases, which are the, the cases dealing with potential ill treatment in uh, uh, the requesting state, but it has also used the two-step approach in, uh, when it comes to the judicial independence cases. Uh, the court, my, uh, the European Court of Human Rights has as such in the famous Avatins versus Latvia Grand Chamber judgment of 2016, endorsed the mutual recognition regime as such, has, in, has applied the Bosporus presumption of equivalent protection to that regime, has also stated that it will determine uh, that issue within the spirit of complementarity, but has said that the mutual recognition regime must always be uh, applied in a manner where if there is a manifest deficiency in the protection of human rights, uh, that may result in, uh, if surrender takes place, in a violation of the convention. What the court has not opined on, and what I will not discuss here today, is whether and to what extent that strand of case law which der derives from uh, the inadmissibility decision in Stapleton versus Ireland, in the chamber judgment in Pirozzi versus Belgium, uh, which Pirozzi is also a follow-up to Avatins versus Latvia, whether that strand of case law will be applied in exactly the, in the same manner and to what extent in cases where potentially we will be dealt with an allegation that the surrender of a, a person under the EAW, or European Arrest Warrant, would contravene Article 6 of the Convention. Thank you so much. Um, so then we have several questions here that go to, the, go to the question of when you have national authorities that are refusing to recognize your decisions, 
I understand that that's outside. You you decide and then other things happen. So I understand the line that you're drawing. But I wonder when you get cases from that country, you know, where the, um, and I won't mention specific countries, but where the national authorities have spoken out against your court and also where the the, the courts themselves may be refusing to recognize decisions of your court. Does that affect the admissibility decisions or the priority that those cases get when they come finally to you? Or it do you know very... what's happening at national level? Yes, and I, I am, of course, uh, very mindful of where this question comes from and in what context. Again, it is very difficult for me to give a general answer the court reacts through cases and through judgments. So in a post application coming from a member state where that kind of uh, assessment has been made by a national court, the court will have to determine to what extent that impacts inadmissibility criteria and to what extent it might impact if the application is considered admissible on issues of the merits. But it all depends. It depends on the nature of the complaint. What is the, the basis or the underlying substantive reasoning adduced by the national court and so forth? So a general answer is, is, un, is I'm, I'm unable to give. If the, if the question is, should the court react in, a diff, in, a, in any shape or form over and above the actual jurisprudential work that it, it, it is doing? No, I mean, again, the European Court of Human Rights is a court. I am the president of that court. It is not for me to comment publicly on reactions to judgments of the court in a particular case. I can only do it generally. It goes without saying, and let me be clear on this, uh, the European Court of Human Rights views every member state under international law as a state entity. Uh, every governmental power of that state is as a matter of international law, subject to the state's international law obligations. So that means that under Article 46, when the European Court of Human Rights has rendered a judgment, that judgment is binding on that state and the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights as a matter of binding, a binding judgment under international law should not be called into question. Those are the general principles which apply to the 47 member states. Wonderful. Um, so I, here we have a, a question from one of our audience members. Um, there's a growing trend that Article 18 has been applied concerning several states, showing that there are ulterior motives for restricting rights, meaning bad faith of state authorities. How is this impacting the court's role and what can uh, the court do when this kind of uh, resistance is growing? Well, again, I, I would answer that question like I have done before. Article 18 is part of uh, uh, the main provisions of the convention. Indeed, it has uh, in the past 10 years or so been invoked by applicants uh, more frequently. It has also been applied and uh, a violation found on that basis more frequently. Uh, that is a manifestation of there being more cases where the court's very strict threshold of application of Article 18 has been met. The court simply will continue to apply that case law if to some extent it needs to be developed because of the realities on the ground, that will happen. Uh, but that, that's it. The court will proceed with deciding those cases when they come. Right. So we have another uh, EU ECHR uh, question on our list here, and we just have a few more minutes uh, left to go. And that has to do with, of course, one of the, one of the gaps in the, in the European legal system or in the relationship between the Council of Europe and the European Union system is that your court doesn't have direct jurisdiction over actions of the EU itself. Um, and so, of course, one of the concerns is that the EU will do something that puts the member states uh, into some tension between your two systems. But in particular, it means that there isn't a human rights review of the actions of the EU itself. So one thing that's happening in the context of the rule of law debate 
in the EU is that some of the member states that are, shall we say, on the receiving end of the potential sanctions are claiming that those sanctions themselves are a violation of the rule of law because they're not included in the treaties. And so that's a fight between the EU and its member states. Um, is there any role for the European Court of Human Rights if someone in a member state claims to have been affected by a judgment of the EU directly, you know, isn't that just a gap in the system right now? And what would you say to people who feel affected by that gap? If the, the, if the measure, which is the source or the alleged source of a human rights violation, is a measure taken by the EU institutions themselves, mm -hmm. there is no role currently for the European Court of Human Rights. However, if it is a measure, even though it originates in EU law, which is imposed by a member state of the EU, then of course an application ultimately after exhaustion of domestic remedies can be raised in Strasbourg against the member states. Well, I mean, that is, that is where we are. Uh, and that is why, what that's, I assume, one of the reasons that Article 6 of the Treaty on the European Union provides for the obligation of the EU to accede to the Convention to provide for that external control. Uh, it is for politicians to decide, ultimately, whether the accession negotiations which are ongoing will result in an outcome where the EU will accede to the convention because when, when that happens, the lacuna that I have just mentioned will have been closed, will have been filled. And so just a, a last question before we wrap up. Uh, is there anything you can say about those accession negotiations and that those of us who would love to see the accession can do to push this thing along? I mean, I have, of course, nothing to say about the negotiations as such. I am not a member of, as it goes without saying, the court, the registry of the court has an observer during those negotiations. So uh, some information is forthcoming. Uh, well, in my view, uh, the, the, both the principled and the jurisprudential arguments in favor of accession are, in my view, very strong. Uh, that is the position that I have taken, the, the position of my predecessors. So all I can say is I hope that uh, the possible obstacles which are remaining can be overcome. And I refer to views expressed publicly by uh, my counterpart at the European Court of Justice, that those obstacles as a matter of law can be overcome. They are say, laid out in Opinion 213. And now what remains is simply political will. And when it comes to political will, I am, of course, agnostic. That is not for me to, to uh, uh, opine on. Right. Well, uh, so, so first of all, I think we, we need to wrap the session. But I must say that I am delighted to hear you, both because you were such a strong voice. In